So now we start on a, a unit of about a half a dozen lectures on probability theory, which most students have been exposed to to some degree in high school. We'll be taking a more thorough and uh, theoretical look uh, at the subject in our six lectures. But before we begin, let's give a little pitch for the significance of it. There's been a extensive debate among the faculty that uh, probability theory belongs right up there with physics and chemistry and math as something that should be a fundamental requirement for all students to know. It plays an absolutely fundamental role in the hard sciences, in the social sciences, and in engineering um, that uh, pervades all those subjects. And it's hard to imagine uh, somebody legitimately being called fully educated if they don't understand the basics of probability theory. Now, historically, probability theory starts off in a somewhat disreputable way in the 16th and early 17th centuries, or 17th and early 18th centuries, um, uh, with the analysis of gambling. Uh, and, but then it goes on to be the basis for uh, the insurance industry and underwriting, uh, predicting life expectancy so that you could un understand what kind of premiums to charge. And then it goes on to uh, allow uh, the interpretation of noisy data with errors in it and the degree to which it confirms scientific and social science hypotheses. But true to the historical basis, let's begin with uh, an example from gambling. Uh, that illustrates the first idea of probability. And then we're going to be working up to a methodology for inventing probability models called the tree model. So let's begin with uh, an example from poker. And I'd like to ask a question. If I deal a hand of five cards in poker, what's the probability of getting exactly two jacks? So there are 13 ranks, and there are four kinds of jacks, spades, hearts, diamonds, clubs. What's the probability that among my five cards, I'm going to get two of them? Well, that's really a counting problem because I'm going to ask, first of all, how many possible five card hands are they? We can think of these as the outcomes of a random experiment of just picking five cards. And there are 52 choose five five card hands in a 52 card deck. Then there are four choose two ways of picking the suits for the two jacks that we have. And so the total number of hands that have two jacks is simply 4 choose 2 times 52 minus 4, the remaining 48 cards, choose the remaining three cards in the five card hand. Um, and then what we would say is that the probability of two jacks is basically the number of hands with two jacks divided by the total number of hands. It turns out to be about 0.04. And under this interpretation, basically, what we're thinking of probability is telling us is, what fraction of the time uh, do I get what I want? What's the fraction of the time that I, quote, win if winning consists of getting a pair of jacks? And by symmetry and, and the fact that we think of one hand is as likely to come up as another, this fraction of hands that equal two jacks it makes sense to think of that as that's our, the probability that we'll get that hand. If we think of all the hands as being equally likely, we yank one out of the deck. The fraction of time that we would expect to get two jacks is this number, about 0.04. So the general setup of probability, the first idea based on this illustration with a pair of jacks is that we abstractly, we have some set of, we have some random experiment that's capable of producing outcomes. These are mathematical black boxes called outcomes. Now, a certain set of the outcomes we will think of as an event that we're interested in whether or not it happens. We could think of it as the event of getting two jacks or the event of winning some game. Then we define the probability of an event as simply the fraction of the outcomes in the event divided by the total number of outcomes. Among all the outcomes, what fraction of outcomes are in the event, and we define that to be the probability of the event. That's the first naive idea about probability theory, and it applies to a lot of cases, but not always. So now let's begin with an example which illustrates why this first idea needs to be refined, and it doesn't really give us the kind of theory of probability that we like. So let's turn to a, a game that was really famous in the 1970s, an enormously popular TV game hosted by a man named Mike. Monty Hall, the actual name of the TV show was called Let's Make a Deal, uh, but we'll refer to it as the Monty Hall game. And the way that this Let's Make a Deal show worked 
was roughly that there were three doors. This is an actual picture of the stage set. Door one, door two, door three. Uh, and by the way, this uh, game show still has a fan base. There's a website for it that you can look at. Uh, and even 40 years later, people are still caught up in the dynamics of the game. So there are these three doors. And the idea is that behind the doors, they're going to have a prize behind one of them and some kind of booby prize, often a goat held by a beautiful woman holding a goat on a leash just to keep things visually interesting. Uh, and that's what you got if you lost. And the contestants were going to somehow or other pick a door uh, and hope that the prize was behind it. There's the picture of the staff. There's Monty Hall and his uh, and the woman who was his assistant, Carol Merrill. Her job was to pick doors to open and show them to contestants to see what was behind them. Okay, so here are the rules for the Monty Hall game. The actual quiz show had more flexible rules, but, but for simplicity, we're going to define a nice, uh, simple, precise, and fixed set of rules. The rules are that behind the three doors, two of the doors are going to have goats, and one of the doors is going to have a prize behind it. Often the prize is something like an automobile, something really desirable. So uh, we can assume that the, the, uh, the staff on purpose will uh, place the prize at random behind the three doors because they don't want anybody to have a guess that some doors are more likely than others to have the prize. And they're not allowed to cheat. That is, once they decided which door is going to have the prize. It's supposed to stay there throughout the game. They can't move it in response to the what uh, which door that the contestants picked. That would be cheating. Okay. Next, the contestant is given opportunity to pick one of the doors. They're all closed, and it's hard to understand how the contestant would make a choice. But if the contestant was worried about the, uh, the staff trying to outguess them on where to put the goat uh, and where to put the prize, the contestant should just pick all the doors with equally, like, with equally likelihood. Then he can't be beaten by their trying to outguess them. He could only be beaten by if they cheated him by moving the goat after he picked or moving the prize after he picked. At this point, once the contestant has picked a door, let's say he picks door two, then Monty instructs Carol to open a door with a goat behind it. So he's going to choose an unpicked door. If the, if the contestant has picked door two, that means that door one and door three are unpicked doors. And Monty tells Carol, open either door one or door three. Uh, whichever one or, or perhaps both have a goat behind them. And so Carol is going to open one of those doors and show a goat. And everybody knows that they're going to see a goat because that's the way the game works. And then at this point, when the contestant has seen that there's a door that has a goat behind it and they're sitting on, an, on a picked door and there's another unopened door that hasn't been picked, the, con the contestant's job is to decide whether to stick with the door that they originally picked or switch to the other unopened door. So if they picked door two and Carol opened door three, they could stick with door two or they could switch to the closed door one and hope that maybe one has the prize behind it. Those are the rules of the game. Now, um, the game got a lot of prominence uh, in a, a magazine column uh, written by a woman named Marilyn Vosavant. Uh, the name of the uh, magazine column is called Ask Marilyn, and she uh, advertises herself as having the highest rec recorded IQ of all time, some IQ of 200. And so she uh, uh, runs a, a popular science and math uh, uh, column with various kinds of puzzles. And she took up the analysis of the Monty Hall statistics and came to a conclusion. Uh, and the conclusion caused a firestorm of response. Letters from all sorts of readers, even uh, quite sophisticated uh, PhD mathematicians, who were arguing with her, or with her conclusion about the way the game worked and the probability of winning according to how the contestant behaved. The debate basically came down to these two positions. Position one said that sticking and switching were equally good. It really didn't matter what the contestant did, whether they stuck with the door that they originally picked or switched to the unpicked door after the third door had been opened, uh, and that their likelihood of finding the prize was the same. Uh, and the other argument very emphatically said switching is much better. You should really switch no matter what. And how can we resolve this question? 
Well, the general method that we're proposing for dealing with problems like this, where we're really trying to figure out what is the proper probability model, is to draw a tree that shows step by step the progress of the uh, process or experiment that's going to yield a random output. And uh, try to assign probabilities to each of the branches of the tree as you go and use that as a guide for how to assign probabilities to outcomes. So let's begin, first of all, by finding out what the outcomes are. So, um, and we're going to be analyzing the switch strategy. So just for definiteness, let's suppose that the contestant uh, adopts the strategy that they pick a door, Carol opens a door that shows a goat, and they're going to switch to the non-goat closed door that they did not originally pick. They're going to switch to the other door that they can switch to. And we're going to ask about what are the outcomes and consequences of winning or losing if you adopt that strategy. Well, the tree of possibilities goes like this. The first step in this process that we've described is that the staff picks a prize location, to a door to put the prize behind. And so there are three possibilities. They could put the prize behind door one, door two, and door three. Okay. Well, let's examine the possibility that they put the prize behind door one. So the next stage is they pick a door. And if they pick um, uh, if the prize is behind one and they pick a door, again, there are three possible doors uh, that the contestant might pick. Contestant has no idea where the prize is, and so the contestant can choose either door one or door two or door three. At that point, the third event in this random process or experiment is that Carol opens a door that has a goat behind it. So let's examine that possi those possibilities. Mm -hmm. So one possibility is that the prize is behind one and the contestant picks door one initially. Well, that means that Carol can open either door two or door three in that circumstance uh, because both of them have goats behind them. On the other hand, if the prize is at one and the contestant picks door two, then Carol the two closed doors have one has the prize one and the other doesn't have the prize three. Carol has to open door three. Likewise, if the contestant picks door three when the prize is behind door one, Carol has to open door two. So these, uh, here she's got a two-way branch. She can choose to open either of the two goat doors, two or three. Here there's only one unopened door with a goat. She's got to open three there too. Okay? And that describes the outcomes of the experiment. That's the, the process of the experiment. And these nodes at the end, these leaves of the tree, describe the final outcomes on this branch. Now, if you look at the classification of these outcomes according to winning and losing, well, we're looking at the switch strategy. So if the prize was behind one and the contestant picked door one initially, then their strategy is to switch and they're going to switch away from the prize door. So whichever door Carol opened to reveal the goat, two or three, the contestant is going to switch to the other one, and they're going to lose. So both of these outcomes count as losses for the contestant. On the other hand, if the, contestant picked, uh, if the prize was behind door one and the contestant picked door two, then Carol opens the non-prize door three and the contestant switches from two, the only choice they have is to switch to one, the prize door they win. And this other case is symmetric. And that summarizes the wins and losses in this branch of the tree. Now, of course, the rest of the tree is symmetric. And so we don't need to talk it through again. This is just simply the case where the prize is behind two. The contestant has the same choices. And Marilyn has the same choices of which unopened door to, uh, to choose. And likewise, if the prize is behind three. So if we look at this tree, the tree is telling us that this is an experiment where, which we think of as having 12 outcomes, three in each of these, four in each of these major branches. So there are 12 outcomes of this random experiment, of which um, six are losses and six are wins for the contestant. And so we discover that there's six wins and six losses. Now, the way that this game works, if you think about it, if the switching strategy wins, that means that the sticking strategy would have lost. 
because if switching wins, it meant that you switched to the door that had the prize. And so if you hadn't switched, you must have been at a door that didn't have the prize. And likewise, if switching uh, loses, then uh, you must have switched from the door with the prize to a door that didn't have the prize switching. And that means if you'd stuck, you would have won. So what we can say is that really analyzing the switch strategy enables us to analyze the stick strategy simultaneously because you win by sticking if and only if you lose by switching. Now this simplification doesn't hold when there's more than three doors uh, and that's another exercise. But for now, it t it's telling us that if we analyze the switch strategy, we also understand the stick, the stick strategy. And of course, that means that if you uh, use the stick strategy, then the six wins become losses and the six losses become wins. And again, um, there are six ways to lose and six ways to win. So the first false conclusion from this is by reasoning about it as though they were poker hands. And the false conclusion says, look, sticking and switching win with the same number of outcomes and lose with the same outcome number of outcomes. So it really doesn't matter whether you stick or switch because the probability of winning in both cases is half the outcome, six out of 12. The probability doesn't matter. There makes no difference whether you stick or switch and that's wrong. And we will uh, see why soon. The other false argument is that we think about what happens after Carol has opened a door. So where are we? The contestant has picked a door, has no idea where the goat or the prize is. Carol opens a door and shows the contestant a goat. What's left? Well, there's two closed doors left. One is the door with the prize and the other is the door without the prize that has a goat behind it. And there's by symmetry of the doors, the contestant has no idea what's behind the door that he picked or the remaining unopened door. They're equally likely to contain the prize. And so the argument is again, that whether you stick or switch between those two doors uh, that haven't yet been opened, it doesn't really matter. And so again, the stick strategy and the switch strategy each win with the same 50-50 probability. And that's wrong too. What's wrong? Well, let's go back and look at this tree a little bit more carefully to understand what's going on. And the first thing to notice about the tree is that it's not all that the structure of the tree leading to the leaves is not the same. Here's a leaf that has degree one. Uh, sorry, here's a, here's a leaf that has degree two one way to get in and only one way out. And here's a leaf that has degree three, one way in and two ways out if we think of going from the root to the leaf. And so it's not clear that these branches, these leaves should be treated the same way. Well, let's think about it more carefully about how are we gonna assign probabilities to the various steps of the experiment? Well, what we're gonna assume for simplicity is that the staff uh, chooses a door at random to place the prize. So that means that each of these branches occurs with probability one third. A third of the time they put the prize behind door one, a third behind door two, and a third behind door three. Okay, let's continue exploring the branch where they put the prize behind door one. At that point, the contestant is gonna pick a door and they can pick either door one, two, or three. And absent any knowledge um, uh, and, and also to be sure that they can't be outguessed by the staff realizing that they mostly prefer door one. So they, uh, so if they're gonna switch, they'll put the prize behind door one to fool the contestant. The contestant's protection is pick a door at random. To have uh, choose uh, door one a third of the time and door two a third of the time and door three at a third time in a completely unpredictable way. And so the contestant is gonna choose each of those possible doors as their first choice with probability a third. Now what happens next? Well, the next thing that happens is that Carol opens a door. Now this is the case where Carol has a choice. The prize is behind one and the contestant happened to pick door one. That means doors two and three both have goats. And again, for simplicity, let's assume that Carol, when she has a choice, she can open either door two or door three here, does them with equal probability. So we're gonna assign probability a half to her opening door two uh, when she has the choice between two or three and probability a half that she'll open door three. 
And uh, by the way, we saw that those were losing outcomes for the contestant. But here, things are a little different. If the contestant has chosen, if the prize is behind door one and the contestant has chosen door two, Carol has no choice but to open the only other unchosen door with the goat behind it, namely door three. So we could say that this choice really is probability one. Um, and uh, I got a little bit ahead of myself here, but having filled in the probabilities on these edges, what we figured out is that the probability of this topmost branch of losing is we said, well, a third of the time you go here, and a third of that third you go here, and half of that time you go to this vertex. So it's a third of a third of a, and half of that, or a weight of 1 18th. And by symmetry, this gets weight 1 18th. But this way, a third of the time the prize is behind door one, a third of the time the contestant picks door two, and after that, Carol is forced to open door three. So this branch occurs with certainty. It's with probability one, which means that we wind up at this leaf a third of a third of the time for sure, and its weight is one ninth. And of course, by symmetry, the similar weights get assigned to the winning and the losing. So what we've concluded is that although there are six wins, the weight of the wins is six ninths because they're each worth, worth one ninth of the time and that winning will occur two thirds of the time. Likewise, there are six losses, but they're each only work, occur an 18th of the time. And so we lose one third of the time by the switch strategy. The summary then is that the probability of winning if you switch is two thirds. And by the remark that you uh, uh, win with switching if and only if you lose with sticking, it follows that you lose by sticking two thirds of the time. Uh, and so sticking is really a bad strategy and switching is the dominant way to go. Now we've, in class, uh, we back up this theoretical analysis. It's very logical, but the question is, is it true? Uh, and you can do statistical experiments and have students pick doors and goats and prizes. And sure enough, uh, it turns out that roughly two thirds of the time and closer and closer to two thirds, the more times you play the game, um, the switching strategy wins two thirds of the time. So the second key idea in probability theory is that the outcomes may have differing probabilities. They may have differing weights. Unlike the poker hand case, when we look more closely at an exp a random experiment with different outcomes, we will agree that for various kinds of reasons of symmetry or logic and so on, that it makes sense to assign different probability weights to the different outcomes. It's not the case that the outcomes have uniform probability, that they're all equally likely. So to summarize, um, uh, what happens, especially, well, this example illustrates the confusion about uh, probability theory that was engendered in even some serious experts. Mm -hmm. But in general, intuition is very important as in any subject, but it's also dangerous in probability theory, particularly for beginners who uh, aren't experienced uh, about some of these traps that you can fall into. And so our proposal is that you be very wary of intuitive arguments. They're valuable, but you need another disciplined way to check them. And we propose that you stick with what we call the four-part method when you're trying to devise a probability model for some random experiment. So the, the steps are first that you try to identify the outcomes of the random experiment. And this is where the tree structure comes up. If you try to model step by step at each stage of the tree what the possible sub-steps are in the overall process that yields the random outcome, uh, that's where the tree comes in, as we illustrated with Monty Hall. Uh, the next thing to do is, among the outcomes, identify the ones that you consider to be uh, the winning events or the, or the winning outcomes or the, uh, or the outcomes in the event that you are concerned about whether or not it happens, getting two jacks, uh, picking the door with the prize. So you need to identify the target event whose probability you're interested in. We could call it the winning event, the probability of winning. The third key step is to try to use the tree and logic of it to assign probabilities to the outcomes. 
Uh, and the fourth step then is simply to compute the probability of the event, which you do in a very straightforward way by basically adding up the probabilities of each of the outcomes in the event. That is the four-step method. Now, this Monty Hall tree that we came up with was um, very literal and uh, wildly unnecessarily complicated. So let's take another look at that and a simpler argument that will lead us to the same conclusion about how the Monty Hall game works, and we'll do that in the next video.